as a core. And in fact, the current Tickle core has at least three compilers in it. It has the compiler for the Tickle uh, evaluator <coughs> into bytecode. It has the compiler for the Tickle expression language into bytecode. It has a bytecode assembler. Any of the three can embed the other two. And furthermore, Larry McVoy independently developed his L language with C-like syntax that also fits on top of the same core and can freely embed any of the other three or any of them can embed L. And then you have the critical extension, which allows you to embed C. That allows you to embed C, but it's not uh, just another language emitting the yeah. same bytecode and freely embedding among the others. So I think we're really to the point where there's a lower level platform emerging that Tickle is a language hosted. Although it sounds like there's several lower level platforms emerging. Remember these different compilers you mentioned? But well, but they're all targeting this common bytecode environment, this common library, the Tickle object system. The, they're sharing a common target. And in fact, you know, Tickle itself and the expert language, which is pervasive among the commands, been there since forever. And there's been some work done, and that's much progress made on it, actually taking that bytecode stuff and compiling it down to machine code, right, Kevin? We're getting started, on, yeah, the very started on the investigations, yeah. Yeah. So I think I have a poll on this one, yes. So considering all of these factors, do you think Tickle would have been more successful if there had been a different language syntax than the current one? And you could rate this from, oh yeah, it would have been, could have made a huge difference if we could have found some other language syntax to, no, it probably would have made it much worse if we picked a different syntax. Does syntax include the concept of everything as a string? Yes. I think I'd include that. Those two are pretty closely tied together. So how many people think that Things could have been way, way better with a different language syntax. Look like proxy. <laughs> Not on that one. A bit more successful with a better with a different syntax. One, two, three, four, five, six. Depends on slightly different or completely different. <laughs> but about probably wouldn't have made much difference. There were one, two, three, four, five. Six. Things probably would have been worse with a different syntax. A little bit worse. Not a lot worse, but two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve. Life as we know it could not have existed without the typical <laughs> syntax. <laughs> Things would have been just terrible. One, two, three, four. It probably also depends on what syntax features you'd shoot in the head as to how that vote would go. Well, it's also it's a little hard to analyze this in the absence of a specific competitor. Also, you know, we're all aware of the issues with Tickle and the things we like about it, but we don't know what the corresponding advantages and disadvantages would have been of some other stuff. So, you open so, to another option, which is no idea. <laughs> <laughs> the, the thing that confused me a lot in the beginning was that the parentheses and brackets work to reverse word for most of the languages here. In most languages, parentheses are for sub expressions, and brackets are for our indexing. And in the beginning, I found this very confusing. OK, then last, I, I thought I'd talk about what, to me, was the single largest <coughs> missed opportunity. It's sort of funny to first have a slide say, maybe we should have done less. And then talk about, well, what's the additional stuff we really should have done. And it was a little bit in conflict. But I want to talk about the web. I don't know how many people have heard uh, these stories, but there were two huge lost opportunities with Tickle in the web. One around 1992 and one around 1994. So in 1992, how many of you were using Tickle in 1992? Anybody here? <coughs> a few of you. So there was this comp.lang.tickle news group. Does comp.lang.tickle still exist? Yes. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, John, when did you do the TK paper at Ethan? Was it 91? I think it was 91 was the TK okay. paper. So sometime around 1992, maybe give or take six months or a year, there was a message that appeared on a comp.lang.tickle. I don't know if anybody besides me remembers this, but somebody wrote and said, 
I've just seen this really, really cool thing. It's called the World Wide Web. Uh, and it looks really exciting, but so far all it has is a text-based interface to it. There was no Mosaic back then. And Mosaic Browser didn't come out until 90, late 93, I believe. And this message said, but I see there's this TK text widget, and it looks like it does almost everything you need in order to display HTML. Is there any chance somebody out there would be willing to fix the TK text widget, add the last few things it needs to display HTML so we can use it for the World Wide Web? <coughs> And so I saw this message, I should have saved it because it would be great to look back on and embarrass myself with every once in a while. <laughs> but there was just so many other things to do, I just felt like, this sounds interesting, but who knows what this worldwide wacko thing is anyhow, it's probably not going to go anywhere. And I've got more important things to do. So I never, I never followed up, never did anything with that. But in retrospect, if, you know, if I'd been able to see the benefit of the World Wide Web, fortunately in that day and age, I wasn't the only one that was looking at the World Wide Web and unable to see what it was going to actually turn into. So I don't feel quite as bad about it, but, but if we had made uh, TK's text widget do HTML, my guess is that Tickle would have become, Tickle Wish would have become Mosaic and would have become the browser for the web. And that would have been, life would have been different if that had happened. So that was, that was probably the biggest opportunity. But then there was another one in the spring of 1994. So that was the year uh, I decided to leave Berkeley and go off to industry. And I, I, decided, I decided to leave. I didn't know what I was going to do. And so I was interviewing, looking at various opportunities in the spring of 94. And eventually decided to <coughs> go to Sun Labs. But during the interview process, I was getting near the end of my process. I'd interviewed at Sun and various other places. and was getting near to making a decision when I got a phone call from Jim Clark. Uh, Jim Clark was the CEO of Silicon Graphics, and actually he had, uh, I interviewed at SGI, and the day before I interviewed, he announced he was leaving SGI. So I did an interview with him when I was at SGI, but he knew I was coming to interview, I guess. Anyhow, he called me up and asked if I wanted to get together, and so I went out to his house and met with him. And he said he was thinking of starting a new company and asked me if I was interested in, in getting involved. And he told me a little bit about what they were doing, but at the time, it didn't sound as interesting. In fact, it sounded a little, even potentially a little bit shady, in that he was talking about doing interactive television stuff, not internet-based stuff, because SGI had been doing had this big interactive TV project at the time. And he mentioned something about he thought there were some loopholes in the IP rights for SGI's interactive television code, and they could potentially walk off with their code and build a new company with, with SGI's code, or something like that. And that, that sounded a little bit shady to me. So. And then I got an email from some guy, I don't know, his name, Mark and Drosen or Dreesen or somebody, saying he'd been talking with Jim Clark also and I'd like to get together for lunch and talk about this new company they were going to do. And it was really late in my interview process. I was, I was kind of getting tired of interviewing and wanted to make a decision and I couldn't tell what they were going to do, so I cut off the discussions. I didn't have lunch with Mark. So that was another thing, if I, that was another woulda, coulda, shoulda moment in that if I had had that lunch and if they had, if I'd known they were going to switch and do something internet related, and it was you know, so a few weeks after that they decided it would be something related to the internet and web browsing, then I think there's a good chance again the tickle would have been in the browser. The JavaScript would never have been invented. It would have been tickle instead, and and life would have been different. So those were two huge you know, woulda, coulda, shoulda moments that I wasn't able to to see the potential of something to follow up on it. And after that there really wasn't another great opportunity to get Tickle into the browser. We tried several experiments at Sun, uh, but as an add-on, it's just not the same as being embedded in the browser. And, and the consequence of that is that many of the things that people use Tickle and TK for, really simple GUIs and form-based stuff, a lot of that stuff all moved to the web. And so that took away a huge chunk of the market for TK. And there's still a pretty good market for it, but, but honestly, probably 80 or 90% of the things that people would have used TK for, they now use HTML for. So that, I think that hurt us badly to miss that opportunity. Okay, so that's my retrospective. I'm running late on my time slot. So I thought I'd spend just a few minutes to talk about what I've been doing since 2000. So fall 2000, that's when Scriptix, or Juba as it had been renamed, got bought by Interworld. Actually, I saw some skimming uh, Wikipedia and various websites putting together my slides, and saw somebody talking about Tickle that said they 
heard that Scriptix and Ajuba was a highly lucrative deal, was sold interwoven. That's not the case. Uh, if you heard that, you, you heard misinformation. I would say it was an honorable exit. We didn't have to lay people off or shut down their office, but the problem was that, that we just weren't getting enough traction in the company. It was not going to make it, and so we sold it, and you know, investors got their money back, and people that sold their interwoven stock right away made a little bit of money. I was not one of those. I, uh, I don't know how many of you may have done similar things in the dot-com era, but I had a, a chunk of interwoven stock based on my scripting stock. And, when, we, when Interwoven bought us, the Interwoven stock was way up high, $150 a share. And then shortly after they closed, they bought us, but before we could actually sell stock, it dropped by $215 a share. And so I thought, well, I'm not going to sell my stock at $135, but I'll wait until as soon as it goes back up to $150 where it was, <laughs> then I'll sell. At which point the stock probably sank another $15 a share. And I thought, this is crazy. Well, okay, maybe I don't need to wait to $150 a share. I'll sell when it gets back to $135. <laughs> Try to guess how many times this repeated, and I sold it to you know, $3 a share or four years later or something. So anyhow, I think the only person that made money off of that was our VP of engineering, John Graham Cumming, who sold everything immediately. We all thought he was crazy for about three months. Uh, there wasn't really a very good fit for me at Interwoven. In fact, it really tickled. They didn't buy it for tickle. They just wanted engineers. So. So they didn't support any tickle development, and I left Interwoven after about six months or so, and took a year off, which was a lot of fun. Coached my daughter's soccer team, and uh, had back surgery. One of those was a little bit more fun than the other. And then about a year later, I founded Electric Cloud, and you may have heard something about the company, but it, Electric Cloud built the world's fastest make system by using clusters of machines running builds concurrently. And uh, we had some really interesting technology in that the, the problem with running make concurrently was that most people did not write their make files in a way that expressed all of the dependencies. And so it wasn't safe to do concurrent builds. The builds would break a lot, particularly large-scale commercial builds. And the biggest sector the company sold it to was the, the cell phone sector with these enormous builds. So what we did at Electric Cloud is we solved the dependency problem by tracking file I.O. during the builds, by using a kernel file system driver to monitor all of the file accesses made during the build. And from seeing the file accesses, you could figure out the dependencies between the build steps. And if one build step reads a file and another build step writes the same file, then you know there's a dependency. So by doing that, we were able to get order 10x speed ups for builds. So Electric Cloud is doing fine. It's been around 12 years now. It's doing about $20 million business a year. It's, it's, not, a, it's not a huge success, but it's a modestly successful business. But after a while, I started missing academia more and more. And so I replaced myself as CEO at Electric Cloud and stayed around several more years to get the new CEO established. And finally left in 2007. Took another year off. And then uh, talked to various schools and ended up taking a job at Stanford where I've been a professor since then. And I have to say, I, I really enjoyed my time at industry. I learned a ton of stuff, but I love being back in academia. So in academia, for me at least, that's my calling. So the longer I'm back in academia, the less I miss industry. Although, I think for me personally, it was a necessary part of my life. I, I always wanted to try doing commercial software. Uh, if I hadn't ever done that, I'd be sitting here wondering what that would have been like. So I'm glad I took time to do it. It's, it's great being back in academia. And I thought I'd mention really quickly the project I spend most of my time on now is a system called RamCloud. <laughs> We're trying to build the world's fastest storage system for data centers, particularly for large-scale web applications. Uh, like Google or Facebook or Twitter. <coughs> so the idea is to build a new storage kind of storage for a data center. And if, if you look at data centers today, this is the large scale ones being built by web companies. They tend to have you know, thousands of machines that divide roughly into two classes. There's application servers that handle the incoming HTTP requests for browsers, and then there's storage servers, <coughs> and, you know, various kinds of storage and backend uh, information kept that's used by the application servers. And the idea for RamCloud is to build a new class of storage where the data is entirely DRAM. So you take a few thousand storage servers, stack as much DRAM as you can cost effectively put on each one. Today, that's somewhere in the 64 to 256 gigabyte range. And then what RamCloud is, is just a software system that aggregates together the storage of these thousands of machines to provide a single coherent system where every byte of data lives its entire life in DRAM. So we use disks or flash memory for <coughs> backup. So the system is as durable and available as a replicated disk system. But you never wait for a disk I.O. for either reads or writes. 
in REMS at, at memory speeds. And so our, our goal, which we're achieving at small scale today, is to get 5 to 10 microsecond access times. That is from any application running on any machine in the data center, get across the data center network with 100,000 machines in it, to any storage server, and back again with a few hundred bytes of data in order to 5 to 10 microseconds. So we're getting 5 microsecond times in a, a small cluster, 80 node cluster. Uh, given the state of networking today, it would be, maybe we could barely get 10 microseconds in a large network because the, the extra time will get taken in the switching infrastructure. So very fast and then very high throughput, order a million operations per second per server. So this is lots of fun. Uh, it's one of these projects that has a really simple characterization. One slide, you can describe what you're trying to do. And actually achieving it is a lot of really hard stuff. Like how do you really achieve the durability without impacting the performance of the system? One of the things we've done is to do extremely fast crash recovery. So we don't keep multiple copies in DRAM. That's too expensive. We only keep one copy in DRAM. But then if that server crashes, you're unavailable until you can read back a whole bunch of stuff from disk or flash. So we built this extremely fast crash recovery system where the backup copies of data from one server are spread across the entire rest of the cluster. And all the servers work together during crash recovery. So in one second, we can, we can get 64 gigabytes of lost data back into memory and reconstruct it and back in service again. That is to make crash recovery so fast that you don't really even notice the system's crash. So that's my current project. The, the data model is really simple, key value store with a few augmentations beyond that. And the hypothesis behind this is that if you do faster storage, it will enable a new class of applications. The, the problem with web applications today is they can have very large data sets, but they can't really do very much with the data. For example, in Facebook, when Facebook gets a request from some user for an, HTT, for an HTML page, in order to respond in a reasonable time, 100 to 200 milliseconds, they can only fetch about 100 to 150 distinct pieces of data in the data center to put together the response for that. And that's a huge limitation for them. You know, if you want to get information about all your friends and all your friends' friends, you can't really do that in 100 or 150 requests. So the, the basic idea is that having faster storage, you can provide real-time results that use very large data sets but also manipulate the data really, really intensely. It's a little bit of a, a build it and hope they will come kind of venture because applications that need a RAM cloud couldn't exist today since there's no storage system that would support them. So we're going to build this. We're building this open source project and hoping that once it's out there, people will find ways to use it. This is something you could only do in a university. It would be crazy to start a company without any, any applications in mind. Just talk to the nuclear hydrogen people at Stanford. They'd be very interested. Any nuclear hydrogen people at Stanford? They'd be very interested in this one. We actually have some contacts. Uh, actually, a person from CERN that's going to come spend the summer with us next year to uh, bring hydrogen. This is also useful for The interesting applications are those that are making lots of irregular small access to data. If you're doing things in a regular way where you can stream the data, then latency drops out. You just care about bandwidth. But for, the, uh, for a wanting low latency, you want to be doing, uh, for example, graph operations and things like that. I mean, the speculative application that I, when people ask me what kinds of applications this could run, the one I talk about that I think is interesting, but a little futuristic, is the morning commute in San Francisco in 10 years. So if you think forward 10 years, what that's going to be like, all the cars will be self-driving. They'll be going down the freeway at high speeds with three-inch bumper-to-bumper spacings packed very closely together. There'll be roughly a million cars on the road at a time in peak rush hour traffic. And each individual car will need to have intimate awareness of some thousands of other cars around it. And that set will change constantly as you move from your house onto a highway and through various interchanges to your work. You can imagine it being a big data center with an enormous amount of data sitting around this tracking all of these cars as they're moving through the, the morning and afternoon commutes. So that's a case where the data set's very regular, it's pretty large, you need to be doing things in real time and very intensely. So just to kind of summarize things, as I look back over my career so far, Tickle and TK are absolutely the best thing that's happened in my career, both in terms of highest impact, which is what I've always tried to do, and also most fun. It was really a blast working on it. I spent about 12 years where that was my top or next to top priority and really enjoyed every minute of that. You know, we can look back and 
see things where we made mistakes, or wish we had done things differently, but the outcome was still a pretty darn good outcome. Way better than I could possibly imagine when I started the project. So it's, it's really, it's really been just a high point for me. And I just wanted to close by saying thanks to all of you who contributed both to build Tickle and make it successful initially, and also to continue to develop it and to continue to attract more users to it. So thanks for, for carrying things forward and continuing to make Tickle such a great system. Disparaging anybody or bringing up any really old baggage, um, if you could, do you have any thoughts regarding Tickle, the language itself, or its adoption based on some of the, the conflicts that, uh, that you had with the GNU project and stuff like that early on? Um, I'm not sure. Can you make that more specific? I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah. Well, so there was the uh, the incident with Stalin, I guess. You know, where he kind of got <laughs> up and did, did his thing. Um, do you think that that and or other events that maybe I don't know about? <coughs> Uh, created a social problem for Tickle more than a technology problem. That's a good question. <clears throat> I mean, I've been, been conflict with Richard Stallman. Actually, I say uh, I didn't have any particular conflict with Richard Stallman, but he had some issues. <laughs> <laughs> I'm shocked. <laughs> I had a lot of discussions with, with him, which I found very amusing, and he did not find amusing in the slightest. <laughs> uh, I think he was mostly upset when we started to. Right? Sorry? That was really at its core a licensing. Yeah. Debate. That was what? It, at its core, it was a licensing debate from his point of view. <laughs> no, his point of view is a moral one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sort of. <laughs> Maybe around licensing. Well, he got particularly upset when we started commercializing Tickle. He was particularly worried then that it's sort of funny that uh, I think he thought Tickle was both, both uh, too tight and too loose. It was wrong in every possible direction. <laughs> uh, yeah, Richard had a much. Well, it still has a much stronger opinion about licensing. It's almost like, uh, my view is anybody should be able to do anything they want with Tickle. I have, sometimes to me it felt like what Richard wants, he wanted to control what everybody did with everything. He wanted everybody to do things his way and no other way. So that, that was probably the, if there was a debate between us. I don't get the sense, I'm not convinced that that really impacted Tickle adoption very much. I think most people uh, tend to do things from much more pragmatic motivations. Uh, Richard was, Stallman's very religious about it, and I think the number of people who are that strongly religious, I think it's a relatively small core. I don't know, maybe other people disagree on that. Yeah. I was going to say the, the, the BSD like license is precisely why it was embedded in so many secret school projects. Right. Yeah, my goal was adoption. I, I didn't care about it. It didn't bother me if people use Tickle and then build proprietary things because I didn't see anything wrong with that. I just wanted to right. see as many people using Tickle doing as many things as possible. Whereas, and Stallman had this religious view. He wanted everybody to subscribe to his view of the world, that everything has to be free. My thought on the, the licensing view of it is uh, uh, you are about uh, elevating the rights of the user to use the code of the C-Fit, whereas Stallman is elevating the rights of the code to be used in what he projects the code would want if it was a person. Oh, that's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> code has rights. Yeah. yeah. So it's almost C3. free. Somebody, it makes me think about the abortion debate, you know, so the unborn baby has rights, and uh, you know, the, code, the code itself is a living entity, it must be protected from the onslaught of evil human beings. So he sees it. Yeah. Yeah, one of the effects of the BSD license has been it's, it's enabled people to invent Tickle and use it in their products. It's disenabled us to publicize it Because a number of my clients, I will say, you know, can I write an article on this? Thing? This is cool. And they say, no, that's our competitive advantage. Tickle is our secret. <laughs> oh, I see. There's a lot of there are a lot of TK applications out there that people have never been to these conferences and never talked about them. Where I get my hair cut, it's you know they have a touch screen and it's bisque and the decorations are <laughs> obvious. And also in a lot of bars and restaurants, you see other pictures. No, did I know that by choosing the color bisque, it was going to become possible to identify TK applications? <laughs> <laughs> <a> watermark. <laughs> John, what about the at some the interaction with the Java team? Do you think that could all be handled better? Where maybe I think I think that was that was pretty much hopeless from the start. Uh, so I went to Sun in the spring of '94. 
uh, Java had been in development of what I think it was called Oak up until then. They changed the name to Java and announced it publicly. And I think Usenix in January of uh, 1995. So I said 2004, 94, 95. And, um, and then actually JavaScript, that announcement with Netscape was done, I think, in the spring of 1995. And, um, you know, Tickle was just not going to work at Sun. That was my eventual conclusion. It, Java was actually, I think, a better match to Sun's personality as a company. It was more of a system programming language, a low-level systems company, and Java was more of that kind of language. So it was, just, it was just a better match, and I think also Sun was able to figure out ways to make a lot of hay from Java. Uh, maybe they could have done that with Tickle if they tried harder. You know, I, I tried to get people to do it, but ultimately I think it was just a just a sort of culture mismatch, that they had one language, they couldn't really do two languages, and Java was probably a better match for the company. So I wasn't, I mean, I wasn't angry about that, and it seemed like Sun was probably doing the right thing for itself. It ended up not being the right thing for Tickle. Java has many co-branded products that uh, kind of shared an umbrella, like it's a bytecode engine that can maybe be turned into silicone in somebody's vision, and it was a language, and it was a class path library, and all of these, so they wanted to be able to get this huge ball of wax. That's my thought. Whereas uh, Tickle, uh, it's emerging over time that it's a platform, as Ken, uh, Kevin pointed out. So. And, then, and then the other thing that wound up happening was that you know, somehow uh, uh, Brent and I managed to call him information <coughs> JavaScript, and instead of getting sued, got hired. <laughs> 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 So, uh, I mean, you mentioned uh, OO in retrospect, but given the, the, the poll outcome on threading and the difficulty to integrate in just concurrency in general in the modern system, what about any retrospective thoughts on threading in Tickle? Um, well, if, if, if this community is representative, it seems like how many people do use threading? Absolutely, it's crucial for you in your work. I didn't ask the converse question. So it's a non-trivial number. <coughs> I guess the question is, are, are you suggesting that threading should have been put in from the beginning, or I should have refused to ever let it be in? Because I can imagine either of those. Well, some options. other languages have it. Um, none of the other scripting languages actually have it as stable uh, for native threads uh, as, as Tickle does. But it's also not actually use that much because people will still rely on the much simpler event model. Um, and so then they, and they, they, they kind of conflict. So it, it's it's kind of funny to have see, oh, look at all the, the threading support is so great. It adds so much complexity, but everyone still uses events. Hmm. Yeah, so uh, you're sort of here kind of stating a question in an ambiguous way, and I, I'm not sure I have anything less ambiguous to say as an answer. <laughs> That's a tough one, because it seems like it's been, it certainly has been a mixed blessing, I think. It's... Yeah, would you, I mean, would you have considered <coughs> that one of the things that you would not have done in retrospect, in hindsight? If something, of all the possible things we could have given up in Tickle, that seems like maybe near the top of the list. If we were going to do less, you know, what would you, what would be the first thing you'd shed? Threading might be up there for me. Kevin? Yeah, I, I argue that uh, um, the way you decided was near ideal, making in terms of thread safe <coughs> but not thread high. Because the uh, subtle outcome of that is that it's, it, it, if, if you are using threads in Tickle, it's extraordinarily difficult to write code that isn't thread safe, <laughs> which is. Uh, Different from every other language out there except Airlock. I think what I would say threading does very nicely is give me the ability to have pure tickle event sources. Uh, because you want because I can have a thread over there doing its thing with a piece of hardware and posting events to the and not have to deal with a C event source API. Is it conceivable to imagine an alternate history? where threading or not threading was a runtime choice rather than a compile time choice. Uh, my guess is that would add a lot more complexity to the implementation. 
trying to make that choice dynamically. I, I imagine it could be done. And the question is, would it have made things even more complicated? Is that an important choice to be able to make dynamically? Yes. Being an OS vendor that has to maintain several packages, I have packages that require threads, uh, a threaded build of Tickle, and I have others I that break on a uh, thread safe yeah, build of Tickle. I'd say that if we could get at least to the point where if you've never spun a thread at the Tickle level, you can still fork. That yeah. would be a uh, major improvement because that would enable, I think, all the relevant code to run in a threaded build. Other questions or comments? Yeah. Uh, what's your go-to scripting language these days? And if it's not TCL, do you miss TCL? <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually not doing a lot of scripting right now. I'm mostly working in RAM cloud, which is C++. And so, so C++ is my go-to scripting language these days. Well, that's sort of a sad statement. It's actually time for when we're supposed to starting the next session we're supposed to have had our break oh. so we're going to take a five minute break i'm sorry john but i'll be here today for tonight i'd be about that till tomorrow morning so i'd love to talk to more of you at breaks and over dinner i'm sorry yeah. <laughs>